and he studied. So Mark, welcome. It is such a pleasure and a privilege to speak with you and I'm so excited to hear what you're going to tell us today. Thanks, Gabrielle. It's great to be here and, and perhaps I can continue the introduction by proudly proclaiming that I'm one of the few people around whose best friend or one of his best friends was an uncontacted tribes person. And therein lies a tale. Uh, the Akorios were a group of hunter-gatherers in the Northeast Amazon living back and forth across the Suriname-Brazil border. And they were essentially dragged out of the, of the jungle into a settled uh, indigenous village, another tribe, about 30 or 40 years ago. And I met them shortly after this happened. Now, within two years, about 40, between 40 and 60 percent of the people were dead, which often happens in this type of situation. That's uh, two problems there. One is that, that the little ones die, which is, of course, the future, but also as important is that the elders die. And when you're in a preliterate culture, the elders are essential to the library. So who knows what knowledge was lost? So in an age where we know there's dozens and dozens of, of uncontacted or isolated tribes in Amazonia and a couple in the Andaman Islands, uh, and these people are coming into increased contact with the outside world, mostly through new desire of their own, um, the, the future for many of these, unfortunately, is bleak. Mm -hmm. Uh, absolutely. And I think that uh, percentage that normally about 50% of people who come into contact with the outside world end up dying from these tribes is staggering and such a loss. And you touched on a lot in that answer that we're going to get to in this conversation and definitely looking forward to hearing more about this relationship with this one man. Um, but I want to start with the basics, which is the vocabulary that we use and how we frame how we speak about uncontacted tribes. Um, and as you mentioned, a lot of these uncontacted, uncontacted tribes are starting to come out of isolation and they are encountering outsiders or planes or pollution or other um, details that hint at outside life. So at this point, is uncontacted still the best word to use to describe these people or is their isolation more voluntary and should we be framing them in a different way? Well, I like the term uncontacted because everybody knows what you're talking about. Now, it's not entirely correct to say that they're totally without contact. Uh, they're definitely isolated. For example, in the Colombian Amazon, where the Amazon conservation team focuses much of its work, there is a river drainage where a tribe called the Carijonas used to live. And they went extinct functionally in a cultural sense over 100 years ago. Well, recently, overflights have spotted Maloka's longhouses built in the Carajona style. So are these people on, uh, are truly uncontacted or not? Well, if they're over 100 years old, maybe they met, you know, outsiders. Uh, I suspect they're what was the result of people running into the forest to get away from the evil rubber trade or the diseases brought in by the outside world and now are going back into their ancestral territories. But this is why it's, it's so difficult to choose the right term. A lot of people prefer the term people living in, in, in voluntary isolation, which is a bit of a tongue twister. Also, when we're talking about isolated peoples, uh, in, in many cases, they have contact with neighboring tribes. So these are contacted tribes. So they're, are they truly uncontacted? You can really get caught in a labyrinth here, but I like the term isolated and uncontacted because it gives a sense of who they are and how they live. And I will say this, my colleague, Glenn Shepard, who's done a lot of work uh, on these types of issues in the Peruvian Amazon says, it's important not to fetishize these people, but they're some sort of noble savage, you know, but I, I also need to point out that they hold a special role in our imagination, people living without iPods, people living without uh, email, and, and, and all of the, 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 the uh, good and the bad uh, that that brings with it. There's a great cartoon that I love of, of some anthropologists showing up in what seems to be an Amazonian village and giving them uh, a box full of technology computers and cell phones and saying, here's technology, we'll be back in a month with antidepressants. <laughs> Yeah, that is probably accurate. <laughs> I think that is very relatable for a lot of us living with this technology. Um, you mentioned before disease and uh, how 40 to 60 percent of this one tribe coming out of isolation died off. Um, and the world is quickly closing in on these groups of people, uh, especially in the Amazon. There's mining, there are dams being built, forest fires are spreading. What are some of the biggest threats that these isolated and, and uncontacted groups are facing? 
I think it's important that, that all of us concerned with this issue with these people as human rights or with the forest and climate change, that we understand that nobody is saying uh, we're, we're walling them off and telling them they can't come out. That, that's ridiculous. What we at the Amazon conservation team are trying to do is to create a wall of protection so that the outside world isn't sweeping in. I mean, there's something called human safaris in Peru where they'll take people in to take pictures of these guys like they're in a zoo or something. I have a problem with that. Narcos coming in, roads being built. Uh, I, I have problems with that. So the idea here is to give these people the room to decide what they want to do on their own. Because my buddy, uh, Pone the Accordio, told me, we knew there was an outside world. We've known it since the 40s when the first planes came over. We know how to contact the outside world if we want to. So this idea that they don't know there's an outside world, I, I, I reject that. I don't buy that. But in an age where we have this road building, we have the narcos, we have the fires, we have climate change, clearly the pressure is on and it's not going away anytime soon. I also think it's important not to paint too negative a picture. There are some good things happen which don't get as much attention. The Peruvians set up two reserves uh, recently, either this year or last year, the Tapiche Reserve, over a million hectares. The issue is on the uh, international docket. We're, we're here talking about it now in Germany, the US, people tuning in from elsewhere. So people are concerned. So we're essentially burning the candle at, at two ends. On the one hand, there's a newfound appreciation for the importance of all tribal peoples and their forests, whether it's climate change or new drugs in nature, whatever. On the other hand, the, the, the rate of destruction is happening as fast, if not faster, than ever before. So, you know, when people say to me, well, in the Amazon, is a glass half full or half empty? And the answer is any glass that's half full is half empty and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're right. There is definitely an awareness being raised about the importance of indigenous peoples, of the knowledge that they hold, how that applies to the science that modern scientists are doing, how everything needs to be supplemented together um, for some proper solutions. And it's good to hear that countries like Peru are building parameters to help protect these groups. Um, I, I, did, I did a paper recently for a very obscure publication called How We Know What We Don't Know. And that is trying to evaluate the medicinal knowledge of uncontacted peoples. And I used three examples. One was the Akorios, how much they knew and how much was lost when they were dragged out of the jungle by the, these fundamentalist missionaries. Number two is the magic frog of the Western Amazon, which is found uh, amongst the Matsez people. When my late friend Lauren McIntyre made contact with these people in, I think, 1969. And the third is the area wow a group of uncontacted people that were contacted in Brazil a couple of decades ago. And it turned out their arrow poison was completely new and, and unlike any arrow poison ever known. Remember that arrow poisons have been important as, as anesthetics and abdominal surgery. And this thing seemed to offer potential as a uh, blood thinner and an age where an aging population, particularly in the industrialized world, uh, is faced with strokes and heart attacks and things like that new antiquarians of the utmost importance. So the point I want to make here is that, first of all, we need to protect the forest, plants and animals. Number two, we need to empower the people or, or, or help the people protect themselves. And the secret sauce for protecting uncontacted people is to work with the uncontacted tribes around them. And number three, we get into the uh, intellectual property rights issue. So it's not a question of we want to go into some uncontacted group and find the cure for cancer and, you know, make a billion dollars. No, nobody's working that way anymore, thank goodness. Mm -hmm. That's good to hear. Um, I do want to skip to that topic a bit and dig in a bit more there about the knowledge that these groups hold that could be of aid to modern society and how we can best extract that knowledge, if that's the right word, or put that knowledge to use without putting these groups at risk of losing their lands, of losing their access, access to resources, of having biopiracy become an issue for them. How do we navigate that really difficult terrain there? This is a very complicated topic, as, you, as I can tell from the way you asked the question. So it's not extracting knowledge, it's about giving these people the opportunity to share wisdom if they so decide in a fair way and based on making an informed choice. That's boiled down to a single mm -hmm. sentence. But I, I'll give a concrete example because it's not just about medicines, for example, we want to develop a pro, uh, uh, some non-timber forest products to put some money in the pockets of the people that wanted it, which could be based on traditional knowledge, traditional culture, traditional practices. And the Acorios 
have 35 words for honey. So we sat with them, found out which were the, the species that produced the most honey, which were the species that produced the most flavorful honey, and which were the species that were not sting bees, okay? And boiled it down to six or seven. So that's a way to, to use indigenous wisdom to help them help themselves without destroying the color, the, the culture or the forest, cutting it down to plant the cure for X, Y, or Z. So that's a success story uh, we've heard here at the Amazon conservation team in Suriname, formerly Dutch Guiana in the Northeast Amazon. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that example. Um, and it's really interesting to hear about your firsthand experience with these groups. And maybe let's go in that direction now. You mentioned that one of your uh, closest friends is a man from one of these uncontacted tribes. Could you tell us a bit more about how you met him, how that experience, how getting to know some of these groups of people have impacted you and your own worldviews and how it shaped your work? Well, I, I work primarily in a village called Komala Samutu in Suriname near the Brazil border. And I got there having been told it was a trio uh, tribal village. But when I got there, I found that there were actually 13 tribes. Uh, one of which was the Acorios, the uh, aforementioned formerly uncontacted group. And I just struck up a friendship with this guy. He's just a wonderful fellow and said, you know, I hear some plants, let me show you a few. And, you know, I, I think one of the problems that we Westerners have when we're dealing with other cultures around the world, whether it's, uh, you know, wine peasants in France or indigenous peoples in the Amazon is trying to do things our own way. And one of the lessons I've learned as an ethnobotanist is you got to spend a lot of time doing nothing. You know, you can't go in there and say, fork over the cure for diabetes because I'm in a hurry, or uh, I've got to do my thesis in 10 months, so cough up the cure for, for something else. Uh, you got to spend a lot of time just being there, like hunting, uh, uh, eating, telling stories, drinking cassava beer. That's probably the hardest part of my job. Um, and, 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 and then, you know, people open up to you. Nobody forms a close friendship in a hurry. You know, mm -hmm. meet somebody in a bar, you don't spill out your, 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 your private secrets. Why should ethnobotany be any different? People are people. So to mm -hmm. me, what I've learned is that, you know, be patient. It doesn't come naturally to us in Germany or the U.S. and in the industrialized world as a whole. And hold on, let me close this. And that we just need to listen, which uh, Westerners aren't particularly good at either. <laughs> and, you know, when you live with people whose lives aren't as tied to electronics, the internet, electricity, and, and all the things we think of as essentials, you really begin to learn to see what is essential, which is people, friendships, family, exercise, water, food. And, and, and that's a real wake up call. I mean, it, it, it sounds like something off a Hallmark card, right? These aren't deep penetrating psychological insights, but they happen to be true. Mm -hmm. And they're the basic human truths that are probably most evident in some of these human cultures. Uh, what have you learned um, about how these people see the outside world as they're increasingly coming into contact with the outside world? They're meeting you, they're meeting um, other people, they're seeing things, they're ch experiencing changes in their water, changes in their air, and they're trying to make sense of them. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that? My worry about the contact with the outside world is it's often done by people who essentially want to extract the resources and destroy the culture. And that could be miners, that could be missionaries, they, they could even be biologists, but not likely. My point here is that we should not, cannot decide what future they choose for themselves, but we must help them make informed choices. Because when missionaries come in and give them iPads and cell phones and computers and say, isn't the white man brilliant? Uh, they don't say, yeah, and we have poverty and we have AIDS and we have COVID, um, all of which uh, are, are mistakes produced by, by our culture. So look, I'm, I'm a proud Western, okay? I don't wanna be living in, in a rainforest and rubbing two sticks together to make a fire. But I think it's, it's grossly unfair and dishonest for us to go into these areas and say, you must believe our religion, you must wear our clothes, uh, you must this, you must that. It's like, look, there's great things about our culture, there's some bad things about our culture. There's great things about your culture, there's some things that aren't, aren't so great. And, and let's make informed decisions here. And so all cultures change. This goes back to Shepard's comment about let's not fetishize these people, but to drag these people out of the jungle 
to, 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 to essentially trick them or force them or bribe them to be Christians or Jews or Muslims or whatever, that I have a problem with, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and that sort of free choice and informed choice is what has all too often been missing for the last 500 years. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I have two questions based off your answer to that one. The first one is something that you've mentioned a lot about is giving these people the information so they can make an informed choice about what they choose to do with their future. Um, what information do they need to make that informed choice? Well, I think they need to know that the outside world is out there beckoning to them and they need to know what that entails and what the trade-offs may be and what the benefits and, 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 and downsides may be. So I, I had a, another good friend, a trio, who moved to the city in search of a better life as promised him by the missionaries and he ended up as a night watchman in a milk factory. Now a night watchman in a milk factory is, is not a job that pays a lot anywhere, much less the third world. And then he moved back to the to village and I said, what are you doing here? He was wearing a breechcloth again. It was really quite astonishing. He said, you know, I, I, I was living in the slums. Uh, I didn't have running water. Uh, I, I had to pay for food, which was terrible. But life is better here. So it, it doesn't mean that he doesn't need to have money in his pocket to buy batteries and fish hooks and, and, and cell phone cards and stuff like that. But he learned the hard way that, that, that the, you know, the Garden of Eden, even promised, has a lot of downsides which was not part of what he was told awaited him. And, and this is why we need to be so careful about how we interact with these cultures and what we're telling them about the outside world and to make sure that they're making not just their choices, but informed choices. Because I've had people say to me, well, they signed the contract, it was their choice. Yeah, you told them they'd have jobs and money. You didn't tell them that they couldn't drink out of the river, that you were gonna cut down the forest. Um, and, and, and that the jobs would go away in three years when, when the mine closed, okay? That's an informed choice to know all of the implications rather than tricking him and getting him to sign a piece of paper for a bunch of bucks. I mean, look, this is the sale of Manhattan. This isn't anything new, right? Beads and mirrors. So how can we get around that? And how can we do that in a way which is, is fair and equitable and which everybody benefits? But then first and foremost, if it's their land, their forest, their rivers. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I want to leave a little bit of time for questions from the audience at the end. So I'll just ask one more. And this relates to the work that uh, your organization, Amazon Conservation Team, is doing to help these tribes protect their cultures, protect their lands. So you've done a lot of work teaching them, equipping them with the skills to map their own territories. That's one way. I know you've also worked with some tribes for them to write down their knowledge in books, but in their own language so that it can't be um, used for ill purposes. Uh, what are some other of the ways that these tribes, these peoples can best protect their culture? Two things come to mind, Gabriel. I'm glad you asked that. And there's more on our website at amazonteam.org. One is this issue of introduction of technology. These people think, well, we'll just give them technology and everything will be cool. Uh, there's a downside to this. For example, once you have uh, a cell phone, you're hooked to the outside world and that costs money, okay? So I, I've had people say to me, this is like heroin. You know, once you get hooked on this, you can't live without it and it costs money and we don't have money, so we gotta move to the city or cut down the forest, all this stuff. So, Technology needs to be introduced in a culturally sensitive way. Instead of doing what I call tech bombing, just going in there and giving them a bunch of toys, we introduce GPSs, which are necessary for mapping the lands. Okay, so this helped them perpetuate their culture and protect their forest and allowed them to take control of their cultural and environmental destiny. Another signature program, which hasn't gotten as much attention, is that of as indigenous rangers. In other words, we trained uh, a bunch of these guys, how to patrol the borders of their land after they mapped it, uh, gave them walkie talkies, uh, helped them use the maps that we helped them create. And at the time they thought this, well, this is kind of interesting, but we don't see the relevance. Well, in the age of COVID where, you know, disease ridden gold miners are trying to get in, they know where the borders are and they're protecting it. And this has been running for over 10 years. You know. Anybody can go into a village and, and give people stuff and put t-shirts with your organization's logo and take pictures and put it on their website. This is all too common. But when you're running a program like this in some of the remote corners of the forest for over 10 years, that is proof 
But that means who protects these lands from the outsiders? And that's why this empowerment and the training of these peoples is so essential, because the less they have to rely on the outside world for anything, the better. I mean, this is a very uh, right wing concept in a way we're teaching self-reliance rather than looking for handouts. At the same time, we're trying to empower the most marginalized people in the hemisphere. That some would consider a very left wing approach. So this is a big tent approach where we're, we're trying to take the best from, from all ends of the political spectrum and, and work with our indigenous colleagues to have them decide what they want to do and how they want to do it. We provide encouragement, training, and, and some financial support. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you so much. And for anyone who's listening, you can learn more on the Amazon Conservation Team website, and I encourage you all to go there. Uh, and I think your answer to that question uh, segues perfectly into a question from a listener, Adrina, who's asking, uh, how do the tribes that you've worked with exchange knowledge with one another? And how do they value their own knowledge? The region and they were arguing over who would work with us, who would get uh, you know first place, most attention, most money. And the, the 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 chief's wife called me over and she said, "Listen, this is a guy thing. The women of all three tribes will work together. Work with us. You'll you'll avoid these headaches." And so the 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 answer, the simple answer to that question is, you have to find the people that want to collaborate, uh, either with you because many will not want to or with other people in the tribe or with other tribes in the region. So this is a very difficult challenge for anybody. This idea that, you know, all of these tribes want to work together and, it, and sing Kumbaya and dance in a circle. It ain't that simple. People are people. Mm -hmm. mm, that makes a lot of sense. Um, we have another question from a listener. I don't, uh, Josh is our listener and oh, he's a very cute listener. He's saying that you mentioned that nearby indigenous peoples, um, contacted indigenous peoples, are the best protectors and allies of the people's involuntary isolation. Can you speak to that relationship more and how your organization supports those relationships? Yeah, we, we like to refer to contacted peoples as the secret sauce uh, to, to get this done. I mean, how do you work with people that you, you not only don't know, but don't want to know and don't want to see? Okay. And, and that's why the answer is, in many, not all cases, is the contact group, because we find out that there actually is some contact there, which gets back to your first question of what's contacted and what's uncontacted. And secondly, you have to remember, because these people live in the most remote reaches, this is the isolated groups, they're often the source of headwaters. And everybody everywhere, and I don't care whether you live in the headwaters of the Mississippi, which is the river I grew up on, or whether you're living in the headwaters of, of, of little places in the Amazon, you want to protect headwaters because if you don't, uh, the result is, is destruction. So these contacted peoples typically want to protect their uncontacted brothers and sisters, as they call them. And that's why this isn't some sort of like, well, we really have to seduce them into doing it because self-interest is self-interest and by protecting them and protecting the forest and protecting the headwaters are protecting themselves. So mm -hmm. that, uh, this again is a generalization, but this is really the, 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 the general approach that we take in these cases. 